Chair now recognizes the gentlelady for the purpose of offering and explaining her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, thank my colleague from Utah, Congressman Bishop, who also joins me in the offering of this amendment. This amendment is a common sense amendment, and it is nothing new to this committee. In fact, the amendment passed last year in this committee by a vote of 37 to 25. Let me explain what it does. This amendment simply says that the cap, which was imposed by the Congress on service contract spending in order to offset what the Pen Pentagon had originally imposed on the civilian workforce would continue. In other words, we said that there would be a cap on the civilian workforce, and if we don't have the commensurate cap on the contract workforce, it would literally just force the outsourcing of any new required jobs. So this is simply the leveling of the playing field. Mr. Chairman, I think that in a letter dated May of 2012, sent by yourself and Ranking Member Smith, it best explained this cap. We both said this cap was imposed because of concern that expected savings from the reduction of staff augmentation contracts and the civilian workforce freeze could be easily lost if either category of service contracts are permitted to grow without limitation. Without this restriction, we are concerned that there would be no reassessment of the validity of requirements and spending would simply shift from one segment of the total workforce to the other. The extension of this cap, which is what this simple amendment does, does not require lawmakers to take sides between the department's civilian personnel and its service contractor. However, a failure to extend this cap would exactly do that. It would show favoritism on the private workforce versus our civilian workforce. So obviously, the compelling equity and efficiency reasons mandate us to continue this cap, and that's all it's doing. You know, Mr. Mr. Chair, both yourself and, and the ranking member, I think uh, in your statement in 2012 said it best, and for that reason, I ask that my fellow colleagues here support this very common sense amendment. Thank you, and I yield back. Ms. Hanabusa. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I also speak in favor of the uh, amendment offered uh, by Mr. Whitman, uh, Ms. Gabbard, and first Mr. Forbes and myself. And I guess as a result, respectfully disagree with my ranking member, Mr. Smith. Mr. Chairman and, and members of this committee, we have looked at this issue before. Now, this amendment, the, prior, the base amendment, speaks to 11 Ticonderoga-class cruisers, as well as three dock landing ships, so we call them LSDs, which, of course, we all know are critical for the Marines. Let's look at what these ships do. We already know from the testimony that we've heard from Admiral Locklear, the commander of the Pacific Command, who said that, as you can see, just in my lifetime, we've grown from basically a sea-controlled environment to now a ballistic missile defense environment. He also said that he cannot meet the requirements as we pivot to Asia Pacific with the number of ships in the fleet inventory now. Removing 14 more doesn't help with the situation. General uh, Amos has already testified that he has a vast shortage of requirements when it comes to amphibious, amphibious ships. Three more out of service doesn't help the Marines as well. But I thought one of the most telling testimonies we received was from retired Admiral Patrick Walsh, who made it very clear that you need, you need the cruisers to work with the new platforms of the LCS. So as we look in our policy statements, as, as we fund or we look to fund about 32 of them into the future, we have to understand the role that the cruisers play in relationship to the LCSs. The LCS, the littoral combat ships, are more for the shoreline. He made it very clear that you need ships like the cruisers in order to afford the protection that our men and women in uniform truly need. So what are we looking at? We already have this Ship Modernization Operation and Sustainment Fund, which covers the 11 Ticonderoga-class cruisers and the three dock landing ships. That's already covered. 
And I cannot see how we are doing something against what this Congress has already told the Navy to do. We're just simply telling the Navy to do what the Congress has already said that they should do. But more importantly than that, our primary concern should be we are pivoting to Asia Pacific. We need to ensure that our men and women in uniform are safe. And we need to clearly understand the interrelationship between what the cruisers do for the LCS, which we all have agreed is the way that we will be looking at Asia Pacific. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I ask that my colleagues vote for the amendment number 135R1 and against the substitute amendment. And I yield back. Chair, now recognize the gentlelady for the purpose of explaining her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, this is going to be the first in your new rule. I'm offering and withdrawing this amendment due to the creation of a new mandatory spending, but I look forward to alternative ways to move this proposal forward. I introduced this bill with Senator Dean Heller, and he has cleared the bill out of the Senate Committee on Veterans Affairs. We in the House should find it incumbent upon ourselves to do the same. This proposal would authorize the Department of Defense to establish an appeals process for Filipino vets who have not been able to have their military service verified by the United States for possible additions to the Missouri list. This bipartisan bill gives these veterans the opportunity to have their records examined and verified by military historians so they can receive benefits. It's been an honor to meet many of the Hawaii's Filipino veterans for World War II and to discuss with them the challenges they have faced in obtaining compensation for their service. After playing an integral part in our Pacific strategy during World War II, over 250,000 Filipino veterans have struggled to obtain the benefits that were provided to all others who sacrificed for this nation during that conflict. As many of you know, they, they were served uh, in the service and upon the call of General MacArthur, and for the next several years, they would share the faith of, our American, of their American counterparts in the battlefield, in prisoner of war camps, and throughout the countryside as part of the guerrilla resistance. Accordingly, Washington promised them the same health and pension benefits as their American brothers. Even after the war, General Omar Bradley reaffirmed that they were to be treated like any other American veteran. However, Congress passed and President Truman signed Public Law 70-301, known as the Rescission Act of 1946, which stripped these veterans of their earned benefits. This remains one of the greatest tragedies of our time, and our nation still struggles, struggles today to compensate these brave men for their valor. This tragedy represents a great injustice to the Filipino World War II veterans and their families and is long overdue for a solution. I was especially pleased when President Obama signed the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009, which included a provision creating the Filipino Veteran Equity Compensation Fund. But, but Mr. Chair, as of April 1, 2014, 45,991 applicants were processed, but almost 25,000 applications stand disapproved. This is because of the Missouri list. All this amendment does is General create an alternative time. way to verify whether these veterans served honorably, and this is a solution that we must have for this terrible injustice. With that, Mr. Chairman, I withdraw my amendment. Without objection, reading the amendment will be dispensed with. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady for the purpose of offering and explaining her amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I offer this amendment and will say up front that I, at the end of my presentation, I intend to withdraw and seek an alternative way forward. However, having said that, I believe that this is an important amendment for consideration. The Repair America amendment would strengthen our strip repair industry here at home and help prevent the Navy from bending the rules when it comes to repairing U.S. naval vessels, vessels in foreign shipyards, shipyards that often do not possess the means to do quality work that American industry is capable of. The provision would consider any vessel not home ported to be considered as home ported in the U.S. solely for the purpose of repairs and overhauls. The, the amendment would also define the term voyage repair in statute. Now we define voyage repair according to Navy instruction. Why this is critical is that as our Navy transitions to a rotational force throughout the Asia Pacific, more ships will be unconventionally ported in poor deployed situation, and these protections are necessary for the men and women of our armed forces. 
The Navy would tell us that this would cost about a billion dollars, by the way, a figure which I question. This provision leaves untouched the flexibility needed to conduct emergency repairs and would simply require more precise planning for rotations, which should be underway already. I am extremely concerned that the Navy and the Military Sealift Command, MSC, continue to obfuscate the original congressional intent of Section 7310 of Title 10, which require vessels home ported in the United States to repair and overhaul in the United States. We've seen an increasing number of Navy and MSC vessels repaired overseas, according to an annual report that required several and that we required several NDAAs before. In fact, MSC has significantly increased the number of its vessels that it explicitly exempts from Section 7310 requirements from 11 in 1986 to 30 this year. The repair of vessels overseas has a deleterious effect on our ship repair and overall and overhaul industry base. We are using U.S. funds to support repairs and overhauls in foreign shipyards that in many cases do not come close to the U.S. standards for wages and working conditions. This amendment would fix that by designating new home ports and strengthening the definition of a voyage repair. It is really an investment in our defense industrial base, one that those who we have the capability of doing these repairs know very clearly that this is something that the United States cannot lose in the future. However, Mr. Chairman, with that, I respectfully request uh, unanimous consent to withdraw this amendment. Without objection, so ordered. Are there other amendments?